Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free streamable classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. Hi, and welcome to another Jazz on the Tube podcast, where we like to talk with the chroniclers of the music. And today we've got a good call with TJ English. I'm a longtime fan of his, his books. Uh, some of you may know the book, The Westies. Did that get turned into the film? No, there was a film called okay. State of Grace that many people associate with that book, but it's not based on the book. Uh, okay. And then you also wrote uh, Patty Whacked, uh, Havana Nocturne, and The Corporation. Uh, and so people may think that, that TJ is, is uh, exclusively a, a uh, um, historian of crime and, and the, the underworld. Uh, but he's also a music guy, and he's put his two interests together in a new book, which I, I'm thrilled to see coming out very soon, called Dangerous Rhythms, Jazz and the Underworld. And it just is a fact that one of the major patrons of music throughout the ages, uh, but especially in the 20th century, has been the underworld, uh, not only jazz, but also salsa as well. Um, and it's great to see this document because it's, it, it, it fills in our understanding of the music and how it was created. And it, and it gives me personally even more respect for these musicians, all the crap they've had to deal with to create their art. It's just mind boggling. Um, so TJ, what, um, well, I can imagine what inspired you because you love music and you've got an inside uh, knowledge of, of the criminal world. Um, but what was it that triggered you to write this particular book? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be on this show. I'm, I'm a follower of your work. And, you know, when you go out and on the hustings to promote a book, uh, a lot of times you're being interviewed by people who don't know anything about the subject. They haven't read the book. Um, so it's a pleasure to connect with somebody who brings so much knowledge to this subject matter. Um, this, was a, this was a subject I had in my back pocket for decades. I mean, this was a book that needed to be written. Um, it's kind of amazing that it hadn't been written. In some ways, I wish it had been written earlier when some of these musicians were still around mm. and could talk firsthand about it. Um, it, it wound up being a, an effort of archival research, mostly because of all these players, uh, central players in this story, are most of them are long gone. Um, but, you know, anyone who knows jazz history or jazz culture and has read history books on the subject or read biographies of individual musicians may have come across references to this history. Uh, it is touched upon in many sources, um, but nobody had really taken the time to focus on this and, and follow the narrative from the beginning because uh, it was just a strange quirk of history that jazz and the, and the mob, organized crime in the United States, more or less started at the same time in the early in the early years of the 20th century. And so the, to follow the development of this relationship is kind of an alternative view of American history in general. Um, and, and more specifically, of course, music history and underworld history. So as a lover of the music, and I've been a lover of jazz since, uh, since I was a teenager and um, was able to break free of the influence of rock and roll, which is pretty much that was all that was available to us in the culture uh, in the 70s, early 70s, when I was a kid growing up, um, jazz was something I discovered on my own and pursued on my own and learned about on my own. And as everyone knows who follows jazz back in the day when you would buy vinyl 
the it was like buying an encyclopedia uh, because it was loaded with the liner notes that were historical and informative and were part of the joy and the process of absorbing the music. So most jazz fans have a sense of the of the history of the music um, because of that. And I I began to uh, uh, accumulate a body of knowledge based on that and further research and then just absorbing the music, listening to the music. And so I had a love for it and I knew there was this connection and I had always wanted to get around to doing this book. And um, I actually signed the contract with the publisher right before COVID hit, uh, but it turned out to be such a great book to be writing during the pandemic uh, while we were all on lockdown. Um, because it was such jo a joyful history. I mean, in a way it's organized crime and there's some violence and there's some nefarious activity and all that. But um, I like that stuff. I mean, that's what I write about. <laughs> so that was not a negative. And the other thing was just to commune with the, with the spirits of the music during the period of the pandemic, you know, to walk hand in hand with Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington and even the gangsters, Mo Levy and and uh, and Joe Glazer, um, the the famous, the infamous manager of of Louis Armstrong and so many other musicians, it was just wonderful, fascinating history to to muck around in uh, for the couple of years that it took to write this book. That's a long-winded answer to your question, but that <laughs> that's kind of how it came together. And you you start um, by talking about the Sicilians. Well, you know, I guess in a way, we uh, the Sicilians, we should we should talk a little bit about uh, what the mob is, the definition of the mob, because I, I'm I'm not sure everyone's um, clear on that. Uh, most people, when they think of organized crime in the United States, they think of the mafia, Italians, and they think the mafia controlled everything, which is not true and, and was never true. Um, the the mob is a larger entity than that. The mob is a universe of connections between the underworld and the upper world that grease the wheel of capitalism, um, because that's the story we're telling here. We're telling the story of the business of jazz, not so much the music of jazz. And so the mob would be underworld figures like the mafia. The mafia were key players in the mob, but they weren't the mob in its entirety. The mob included not only other ethnicities uh, of, of gangsters, uh, Irish, uh, uh, predominantly Irish and Jewish back in the early uh, years of the 20th century, but also we're talking about corrupt officials within the upper world, you know, politicians, cops on the take, all of these people are part and parcel of what we refer to when we talk about the mob. Sicilians uh, the early 20th century had seen a, a, a sustained period of immigration by Sicilians into New Orleans and Louisiana. And this was interesting. It formed a, a foundation for many things related to business. And one of the things was the um, owning and managing of clubs, um, not called nightclubs yet. That term was not common. They were called honky tonks um, and other things. And um, the Sicilian immigrants owned a number of <clears throat> and became amongst the most prominent early patrons of the music. Um, they actually laid down a template, so to speak, of, of, a, of a relationship between the club owners uh, and the musicians. And this became a template that would hold for decades, uh, throughout most of the 20th century, in fact. And that's where, it's all st that's where it all started. And, and, you know, the, I, I'm, I'm uh, half Italian, and yes, when we go back to our uh, late 19th century roots, one of my ancestors ran a, a nightclub, I guess it wasn't called a nightclub then, in, in what is now, uh, what's, that town, what's that thing right across the river in Long Island City? Um, and, and this was something that was open to immigrants as a business because they were locked out of law, they were locked out of medicine, they were locked out of professional jobs, banking jobs, so they had to hustle. And I guess the other thing th that we should always remember about the Sicilians in New Orleans in particular is they were not racists to the degree that the the Anglo-Saxons that were running New Orleans were. Uh, they, they served uh, Black customers, 
Uh, the first guy to really record black music later, many decades later, was a Sicilian. Um, somehow St. Joseph's Day, which is a Sicilian saint, is celebrated by the Mardi Gras Indians as one of their high holy days. Uh, so there was a beautiful connection between that, those two groups of people. And, uh, and so it, it looks like they were the pioneers of what we now call nightclubbing um, uh, down, down there in, in New Orleans. Yeah, absolutely. Um... One of the things about this relationship between the underworld and the music is interesting because it was mostly uh, a coming together of immigrant, the immigrant class, the early 20th century immigrant, even the late 19th century immigrant class, Italian and Irish and, and Jewish and African-Americans. And it was separate from the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant hierarchy. In fact, you know, as you know well, jazz was looked down upon by the WASP establishment, by the American establishment. Um, it was excoriated in newspaper accounts of the music, and it was seen as a dangerous thing. And the fact that it was a meeting of the minds between the immigrant class and African Americans was even more, made it even more terrifying to the, to the ruling class. And so the music from its origins, certainly as this business template was laid down, um, this was the music of the streets, the music of the people. Um, it was something that could not be denied. It was not being supported by the higher society, by musical academies. It was not being supported in the way that classical music, European music, was supported and presented to the public. It was completely and totally a people's movement. And so the mob was part of that movement. I guess it was a bit like uh, hip hop in the sense that hip hop came up from the streets. Uh, it, it was not welcomed initially, uh, but it, 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 literally, it literally could not be denied as well. And then, and then in Cuba, you have the, other, the parallel of Son, um, which, which now is considered, you know, just as mainstream as you can get. But when it first originated, it was considered ghetto trash. Like you, you wouldn't have that in, a, in polite society. Well, is this, is why we, this is why we love that music. Um, <laughs> you know, the music that comes up from the streets and is totally real and organic and authentic. This was part of the attraction of jazz and it's still part of the attraction of jazz. I mean, and, and the people who are the aficionados of the music know that and the interesting thing is many of the mob mob figures who who ran the clubs knew that i mean one notorious figure jumping ahead in the history was morris levy who was the originator and owner of birdland the club yeah. Birdland. he was uh by all accounts uh he was a hoodlum and a crooked character who ripped off who routinely ripped off musicians he had a saying if you want royalties go to england I mean, he was blat he was blatant about it, the way he would uh, rip off musicians. Yeah. But he he was very progressive in his understanding of the music, and in fact, when he opened Birdland in 1949, it was the, it was in the midst of the bebop revolution. Bebop was controversial music; it, it wasn't for everybody. Some people thought it was non non commercial. Um, but Mo Levy understood that the true aficionados who are the true supporters of jazz, the ones who will, not the fair weather followers of jazz, the true aficionados, they want authenticity. They want the cutting edge music. They wanted bebop. And so he was a big supporter of bebop and other cutting edge uh, music. He was one of the key guys who brought Latin, the Latin styles into the music in the 1950s. Um, the Palladium nightclub was just across the street from Birdland. And a lot of the Latin musicians would play Berlin and, and there was a wonderful cross pollination that took place. So whenever we talk about this history, uh, we wind up talking about the good and the bad. Um, you know, the fact that they were criminals uh, running the clubs, the fact that um, it was sort of a plantation system, let's be honest, that's what it was. Ultimately, the musicians to a degree were taken advantage of, but, um, it was the only game in town, um, so there wasn't really a choice. I have a funny story, a uh, little off topic, but if you don't know it, you'll love to hear it. Um, Eddie Palmieri recorded this album called, was it 52nd? No, Riverside Drive. 
fa famous record with, with a street name in it. And he was very outspoken politically um, at the time as well. Oh, oh, no, no. What happened was the Weather Underground loved that album. Uh, and, and so the FBI paid a call on Morris Levy. <laughs> Do you know this story? No, no, I oh, don't. Oh, you'll love this. You'll love this. So, so um, you know, because they want to know what was going on. Why, why, did the, why did these radicals have this album on their turntable? And why were they listening to it all the time? And so then Morris Levy called Eddie Parmieri and he said, listen, Mr. Parmieri, <laughs> I let you do what you want to do, but I never want the FBI coming to visit me again, asking me about your music. It was just, it's just a, a funny, a funny sideline. That's, that's funny because Levy, there, Levy was being investigated by the FBI over a period of about 10 years. So that would have just been another uh, strike against him among many. Exactly. Hey, let's let's switch gear to the great uh, par musical paradise of Kansas City. And I think it's possible that there are a fair number of jazz fans, especially younger ones, that don't understand what uh, a, a epic uh, environment for music Kansas City was. So let's talk about that. And then let's also talk about the basis for which that miraculous flowering of music occurred because i think it's one of the greatest things that ever happened in the history of music yes forget, forget exactly. jazz just music in general right well and it also ties in so uh appropriately to this particular subject matter because uh that scene in kansas city was basically underwritten by the political apparatus the political machine in kansas city and so it involves a lot of the corruption that was in place during this period of the 1920s, the, the, the jazz age, prohibition, the prohibition era. Um, it's so fascinating the way that jazz um, comes up the river from New Orleans and starts to spread around the United States um, in the Midwest, um, certainly Chicago, but you know, also places that aren't uh, normally recognized as bastions of jazz, like Kansas City and, of course, St. Louis and, and, and Detroit and other places. Um, Kansas City became the nexus for so much uh, of the music and also the criminal development of this era of the 1920s. The town was run by a, a political machine controlled by a very colorful character named Tom Pendergast, T.J. Pendergast, who was the political boss the Irish American political boss of Kansas City, and he had tremendous political power. And so the system of the clubs that, that developed in the 18th and Vine district of Kansas City, all these clubs started to spring up in the early 1920s. And they were um, part of a, almost you could call a, a vice movement uh, that was taking place in the United States as prohibition set in, uh, it was kind of an attitude of let the good times roll. And the good times involved prostitution, primarily prostitution, gambling, and jazz. Those were the pr three primary elements of uh, the, the jazz age and the prohibition era. The prohibition era was a phenomenal uh, boost to the business of jazz. In fact, uh, it altered the trajectory of jazz uh, as a popular cultural idiom for all time. I think you could make the argument that the music, the, the horse was out of the barn already. The music had been developing for a decade or more. And it, without prohibition, I imagine the music would have continued to develop. But it's undeniable that prohibition created a framework for presenting the music to the public that was unprecedented. And a lot of it had to do with speakeasies uh, you know, every speakeasy, and there were dozens of them in a town like Kansas City, uh, had, a, had a trio or a quartet or a quintet, a smaller group. And then the, the clubs, the larger clubs, like uh, Cuban Gardens, became a very popular club in Kansas City. They would have big orchestra, an orchestra of 25, 30 musicians. And the only place that it could afford to have an orchestra of 35 or 40 people was, was a club that was run by the mob. And that, was gen that was generating money, and this is very important, not only from the music, but from the sale and distribution of illegal booze. Well, there, the, yeah, there you go. I mean, the, the band brings in the crowd, the crowd buys the booze, and yeah, that makes, yeah. makes the wheel turn. So the money that was being generated by 
bootlegging and, and the distribution of an illegal product, alcohol, and, the, and a, a very popular illegal product, was what generated the money to make it possible for the music to explore its, its outer contours in a way that it might not have been able to do. And so in Kansas City, you had a musician like Benny Moten, who was a local, uh, brilliant local musician, who also became the leader of the local musicians union. The musicians union was in the pocket of Tom Pendergast and the Pendergast machine who were part and parcel of that. Um, um, they had patronage power. They had patronage power through their connection to the machine. And Benny Moten, in that sense, was a member of the mob, but was part of the mob. Um, he doled out cabaret cards to musicians, were, were, which was absolutely essential to be a working musician in Kansas City. And um, the Pendergast machine took care of that union. And the reason they took care of that union is that union uh, guaranteed a certain number of votes come election time. And they always turned out for the machine's candidates in various local elections. That's how it worked. And so Kansas City was just a glorious period. There's a number of uh, books on this subject. And of course, there was a movie by Robert Altman called Kansas City, which is not a great movie, but it's a very, very good recreation of the era. And the music is great in the movie. Um, and so it's worth seeing in that regard. Um, yeah, it was a spectacular time. And it had a, such an influence on the development of the music. Really, it was a blue, it was blues el element that came up from the South to Kansas City and, and found its own voice there. And forever after became known as the Kansas City Sound. And it was so popular that you would hear this style of jazz in, in New York or Philadelphia or other places where jazz was popular. My, my understanding is that literally from, from accounts of, from people that lived through it, there was music 24 seven. Yes, they, well, it, there was no closing time in Kansas City. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's some wonderful oral history accounts. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons this book was popular, I mean, sorry, was possible, and I, 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 it's incumbent upon me to say this, but one of the challenges was all the musicians were mostly dead and gone uh, from the eras that I'm writing about. Luckily, um, certain cultural institutions were smart enough to do oral history interviews with a lot of these jazz musicians before they die. And so there's repositories of these oral histories at places like Rut Rutgers University is one, the Smithsonian is another, there's, there's a couple others. Uh, and these audio interviews, which are all a you're able to access online uh, for the most part, uh, are a treasure trove of memories and accounts of these different eras. And so you can hear firsthand accounts from people like Count Basie, uh, Mary Lou Williams, about the scene in Kansas City during the glory years of jazz in Kansas City. Uh, and it was amazing. And, and the way it fits into the, the puzzle that we're talking about is it was a continuation and a further enforcement in, in, uh, of, of this relationship that had started in New Orleans and the template had more or less been laid down in New Orleans, the idea of clubs owned by mafiosi and other underworld figures that were connected to the larger apparatus of the mob. And this is true in Kansas City. It's true in other areas that I write about in the book. It becomes the relationship that exists for a period of about 80 years. Gotcha. And, and you know, something that may not occur to young people uh, but is really important to grasp is the reason live music was the thing was there was no such thing as a sound system. Like, like you, you couldn't put in big speakers and a, and a turntable and entertain people with canned music. The only music for a night, for a nightclub was a, a live band. And yeah, and that, you, that does change when recordings uh, come into being um, record albums. You could of course hear it on the radio, but even on the radio, it was live. It were all, these were all live telecasts. This is kind of how the music spread like wildfire all around the country was on radio. So you'd have live shows from New Orleans or from Chicago and they'd be telecast everywhere. And so people in, in Denver and in San Francisco and in Seattle and Los Angeles were falling in love with the music in real time 
because they could hear it on the radio. Yeah, there's a funny story. I think it's Benny Goodman. He had a radio show in New York that was really late at night and he wasn't getting much traction, but out West, it was playing earlier in the day. So more people heard it. And when they went out to yeah. do a gig in LA, the, the place was jammed and it was yeah. all the func function of, of the radio. Um, hey, listen, speak, going up river now, um, we, we can't talk about this subject without talking about uh, Chicago, you know, the, the ultimate gangland city. Uh, talk about the, the patronship, patronage of uh, jazz by uh, the Chicago mob. Well, this may be, I mean, Al Capone, the mob boss of, the, of Chicago, may have been the, the biggest patron of jazz in, in the history of this narrative. He loved jazz. He also loved opera. Um, these two musical styles, I think, res res uh, represented two sides of his personality. Um, opera representing his Italian roots and jazz representing his American reality. He loved jazz. Um, he was a patron of the music, and then he became a patron of the business. He had uh, a piece of four or five different clubs in the Chicago area, some of them very popular clubs. Um, and not only that, he would show up in these clubs fairly regularly. There's a club in Chicago that is still there called Green Mill. Anyone in Chicago will know this club. It's kind of a glorious place. I guess it's Chicago's version of the Village Vanguard although I think it opened earlier than the Vanguard. I think it opened in, in 1908. I, I may be off by a couple years, but uh, it may be the oldest existing jazz club in the, in the United States. Great place. Capone had his regular booth in that club where he would sit with his buddies and listen to the music. He was such a big fan of the music uh, that once, and, and this is a, fa uh, a famous anecdote, in the history of this relationship. Um, some of his underlings as a birthday present for Capone kidnapped Fats Waller, who was had been playing a residency at a club in Chicago. And um, Capone had gone to see Fats Waller and just loved him um, as anyone would. Um, Fats Waller was one of the most spectacular jazz entertainers to come along. He's still, to me, in the in the pantheon, the great entertainers of jazz, his stage persona, the kind of joy that he brought to what he did. He was one of those kind of jazz musicians like Louis Armstrong, that you'd sit down for a set and you'd have a smile on your face mm -hmm. throughout the entire set. Um, so they took it upon themselves to kidnap um, Fats Waller at gunpoint and tell him that they were gonna set him up at a hotel in Cicero and that he was going to perform for Capone's birthday party over the course of the weekend. And so that's what occurred. It was a great surprise to Al Capone that Fats Waller was brought in to play for him and his party. And this went on the course of a Friday night, a Saturday night and into a Sunday. And so Waller who had, you know, this was all done, uh, you know, not with his not with his understanding or cooperation. It was a surprise. And when they first grabbed him at gunpoint, according to Fats Waller and his accounts of this incident, he was terrified. But he got over it because um, they they basically lavished him with cash over the course of that, that three day weekend. And he went back home to Harlem, in New York City, uh, with his pockets stuffed with cash. He claims to have gone home with about $3,000, which in today's money would be close to $30,000. Yeah, at, at least, at least. That's a good weekend. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, this is a sidebar, but but it, it, it merits mentioning. Another guy who loved jazz and opera was Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong. He loved yeah. opera and often quoted it in his solos. And I, I love this image of him as a kid hanging out at the French opera outside yeah, he's craning his ear to to hear the the music because he loved it. And, well, he had uh, such a, he had such a sophisticated musical ear, Louis Armstrong. I mean, he was way ahead of everybody in terms of how he was hearing the music, and yeah. then how how he himself interpreted the music when when he played his instrument and also as a singer. 
And then when you think of all those Creole musicians that were employed at the French opera, who then mix it up with the uptown musicians, you know, the, the opera has a, has an important role in the, in the development of jazz. I, I, my, my, my definition of jazz is where the cane fields met the opera house. Uh, that, well, that's that, the, this is the beauty of jazz, right? It, it, it was democratic enough that it became, uh, uh, it just, it sort of took in elements of all kinds of music. And, and this would become a, a controversy that exists to this day, of course what is jazz and what defines jazz and what is some people are purists about it and they believe that it's not jazz unless it has its roots in the blues and swing music and everything right. other than that is a is a pretender but others would say no jazz always was open to incorporating musical elements from other cultures and also improvisation and all these elements of jazz that have become part of the music also and there, you know, there are other uh, jazz musicians who don't even like the term jazz. Don't, don't, don't even use that word. Yeah, yeah. So we had uh, sort of the pre-prohibition stage. Then we had prohibition where organized crime flourished and, and nightlife flourished. Uh, and then prohibition ended. But the, the connections, the, the infiltration of organized crime into polite society did not end with prohibition. And I think uh, I, I always pronounce this guy's name wrong. Kefaufer? Kefaufer. Yeah. There was, there was actually, uh, and I wonder if you know the answer to this. I've been trying to find the answer. There was a hearing that revealed in the 1950s the extent to which the United States was still kind of poisoned by, by organized crime at the municipal level. And, and you occasionally see footage of those hearings, little, little snippets. And I, but I've never been able to find an answer does somebody have the whole collection of those hearings because they must be amazing the things that oh, they, I, I assume they exist i've never i've never looked into that exactly but they must exist because the whole thing was recorded but you have to keep in mind the key for hearings were comprised of a series of investigations that existed in over time, over about a year and a half, in different cities in the United States. It was like a barnstorming tour. Keith Hoffer, Keith Hoffer took his investigating committee to the different cities, and they had hearings in the different cities. Um, so I assumed it was recorded in all these different cities. Um, it's interesting you mentioned this, the ending of Prohibition, and what that meant for this relationship that had flourished in an unprecedented way during the, the roaring 20s and the years of Prohibition. Uh, not only did it not end in the 30s, it kind of went into a new stage of development. And it was interesting because um, it became a kind of a way that the mob franchised itself in different cities. So, and not just the big cities, the obvious cities that we all know were mobbed up, like Chicago and New York and, and Kansas City and New Orleans, but smaller cities like Pittsburgh and Denver and of course, Los Angeles, um, any of these cities, mid-sized cities and big cities around the United States where jazz clubs would open up, and this is the years after Prohibition, they were inevitably run by a local mobster or local criminal element representing the mobster from the nearest big city. The mob was actually franchising. It was establishing an outpost in th these different cities through the existence of the nightclubs and their control of the nightclubs and how that gave them a point of entree into the business structure and the culture of these different cities. And so in that sense, uh, the development of the clubs and the music in this relationship was kind of crucial to the spreading of the underworld in the years after Prohibition. And the key offer hearings, which you mentioned, focused almost exclusively on gambling. Mm -hmm. they, the, 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 those hearings were to explore the relationship between gambling and how gambling had corrupted the, the overworld, the political apparatus, law enforcement that were being paid off to allow gambling operations to run in different jurisdictions. Remember, this is pre-Las Vegas. So mm -hmm. when people wanted to gamble, and gambling was huge, gambling was, was and still is a big addiction in the United States. People wanted to gamble. They'd go to resort towns like Hot Springs, Arkansas, 
And there were a number of others, Covington, Kentucky, uh, of course, Atlantic City. And these places had casinos that were also nightclubs that showcased jazz. So jazz was the music of this expansion that the underworld was making via the clubs. You know, the, 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 the uh, organized crime had a financial problem when uh, prohibition ended because that was such a huge revenue generator. But luckily, they had a lot of cash. And I think that's what they did is when prohibition ended, they just started investing that cash in, in you know, the, the nightclub franchising business. A, a, a little piece of history, um, uh, uh, Jack Ruby, the no notorious Jack Ruby, who ran a, a strip club, which I imagine, well, I know it was mobbed up. Um, he was sent from Chicago by the Chicago mob to Dallas to open that place and run it. And the thing about nightclubs, too, is a place where people can come and go at all hours of the night. And if you are a criminal, it's a good place to have meetings. Uh, it's a good place to bring drugs in the back door and out the front door. I mean, they're, they're very useful uh, enterprises for a lot of different reasons. Yeah, so no, that's, that's a crucial point because um, the clubs existed primarily as a front for the underworld figures to launder their illegal profits. So profits from gambling, other illegal activities, and later narcotics were laundered through the clubs. And so the club wasn't necessarily burdened with the obligation of turning a profit. That wasn't their primary reason for existence. And this was great for jazz. Um, and it, it remained a boon for jazz in the years when jazz started to wane as a commercial entity, as jazz went from controlling about 80% of the music market in the United States to dwindling to something much, much, much smaller than that. Um, and, and so, but the music sustained itself as, as a, a live uh, form of music in the clubs, thank, thanks to the fact that these clubs often were just fronts for um, gangsters to launder their money. I know you've written a lot about Cuba and, and anybody interested in Cuba really needs to read uh, uh, TJ's books because you can't understand Cuba without them. Um, I was uh, down there talking with a musician about starting a jazz, the, just the idea of, God, there's so many great musicians. Let's start a jazz loft, you know? Um, and she said, we can't do that. I said, why not? She goes, the government strictly controls live music venues. They don't issue, you can, if you want to start a restaurant, we can start one tomorrow. You want to start a live music club? That's going to be really hard. And I said, are you kidding in Cuba? She said the government's terrified of the mob influence on live music venues all these decades later. Yeah. And that's well, the reason they keep their thumb on it. It's also the, just the fact that it's a communist ec economic system. So all these things are run in partnership with the government. Um, and there's, from what I understand, red tape that it would blow your mind in, oh, sure. regard, in regards to starting any kind of business. But, uh, but, but, but if you want to, if you want to open, a, I don't know what it is like now, because things have changed in the last couple of years, but really, if you wanted to open a restaurant, it, it was doable. But there was literally a ban on live music because during the, as you know, during the uh, Havana era when it was, not, you know, owned by the mob, run by, it was literally run by the mob. And each one of these nightclubs had thugs that were bodyguards that I'm sure doubled as political enforcers. And it really was a major social problem. And I think it traumatized the people that are, are in charge of Cuba now. I, I don't think they've forgotten how bad it was. I mean, it was good for people coming to party. Uh, it was good for the musicians. But as you know, Cuba, is a, when it gets cut loose, is a very violent, has the capacity to be a very violent place. Um, and it was, it was a social problem to have the mob running things at night. You know? Well, that dynamic you describe is, is one of the things that contributed to the revolution happening. Um, in this book, Dangerous Rhythms, I have a chapter on Havana. Uh, it, it's in some, some degree a repeat of what I cover in the book Havana Nocturne, except um, what I really welcome the opportunity to do was to put what had happened in Havana in the 50s in the context of, of this larger narrative of jazz in the underworld, because what was occurring in Havana in the 50s was exactly the same as the template that had been laid down 
in New Orleans and in Kansas City and in other places. There were elements that were unique. Um, for instance, um, they had to control the government of Fulgencio Batista and basically establish him in power so that they could uh, have a friendly government there to, to run things the way they wanted to run things. But the whole system, including the, the, corrupt, the corrupt framework, was established in the United States in uh, the pre-prohibition years and then into the prohibition years. And Cuba was part of this dream from, from the very beginning. There's some famous history of a, a group of American mobsters visiting Havana in 1927, uh, including Al Capone. And they had set their sights on Havana at that time as a, as a place to smuggle molasses, to make rum and to bring a uh, booze from Cuba into the United States. Uh, but they had always had this dream of establishing an, a gambling mecca there that would be similar to the resort towns that existed in the United States, in which they'd, they'd control the local political apparatus and they'd run things the way they wanted. The beauty of doing it in Havana, Cuba was you were outside of the United States. You could not be pursued by American law enforcement for what you were doing in Havana, Cuba. And that was a, that was a big dream that they kept in their back pocket for decades and then eventually brought it to fruition in the in the 1950s again the the operative thing for us and this topic we're discussing right now is how it affected the music mm. and again it was glorious for the music um providing venues for the musicians um but also bringing elements of latin music into jazz and 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 facilitating the phenomenon of Latin jazz, which I is a personal favorite of mine, which I love. I just love the rhythmic elements of that style of jazz. And so this period of the mob in, in Havana uh, really um, fueled the development of that music in a way that is undeniable. Absolutely. So, so continuing with this trajectory, uh, so now um, prohibition's over. Uh, and now rock and roll rears its head, and 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 I, I don't think we can underestimate the impact of sound systems. The idea that somebody could show up with some speakers and a turntable and entertain a, a club or a party. Uh, once that happened, that changed everything. So now jazz is no longer the big draw. It's no longer the you know because because you, you you say that 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 the um, the nightclubs supported the musicians, which is true, but. Also, the musicians brought the crowd, so it was a symbiosis. The better the musicians, the more booze they could sell. But now, the musicians aren't bringing in the crowds anymore. So, how did the uh, uh, organized crime jazz relationship change when when it wasn't such a a juicy proposition? Right. Well, there's a few things we want to touch on. I think before we get to that. Okay. Uh, yeah, because it wasn't that prohibition ended and then we get to rock and roll. There's a oh, few. True. There's a few important things in there. One of them being uh, the phenomenon of 52nd Street in New York, this jazz mecca that was in many ways a vice district, similar to all the vice districts that popped up in different cities in the United States that involved jazz and gambling and prostitution. And in the case of 52nd Street narcotics, this is the period where heroin really comes in to the culture of jazz in, in a big way. And in many ways, it's the, it's the dark nadir of this relationship between musicians and the underworld because the underworld is instrumental in bringing heroin into the picture. And heroin winds up destroying the lives of many great, great jazz musicians. Um, but 52nd Street, again, was a musically a glorious period for the music. Uh, they, it showcased bebop a lot. In fact, there's a certain style that comes from 52nd Street that I think a lot of people think of when they think of jazz. You know, the dark club, the little basement clubs, and lots of cigarette smoke, the intimate nature of the music. Um, you know, they would incorporate things like bongos and the bohemian, the bohemian style, you know, you picture Jack Kerouac reading a poem with, with the bongos and some jazz music playing in the background. This was a style that grew up in 50, on 52nd Street. Um, and many future great musicians were greatly influenced by what was taking place there, including vocalists like Frank Sinatra, 
who would go to the clubs and heard Billie Holiday sing live on 52nd Street for the first time and always admitted in later years that she was the premier influence on his styles as a, as a vocalist. Um, a very influential period, and also probably the most mobbed up era. I mean, the gangsters were bold during this period. They showed up at the clubs, they hung out at the clubs, they were seen at the clubs. And of course, this was all part of the, the naughtiness and the attraction of this relationship in a way. People did not shy away from the connection between mob and the underworld. In many ways, it was part of the attraction. Your earlier reference of, of rap and hip hop is is just a continuation of this mentality. In many ways, this story is the story of the underworld and the music business. It just so happens that the periods that I'm writing about, the music business was jazz. Um, that was the music business in the United States for many, many decades. Um, so you had this period, I uh, and and this was a very fertile period for the music and also a fertile period for the connections between the underworld and, and the music. And by now you do have recordings and you do have the dissemination of music and the mob had their hooks into all of that. Mm. Uh, this is important to know. It wasn't just the clubs. The mob had their hooks into the recording studios. And, and in some cases they own the labels. Mo Levy, who was the co-owner of Birdland, also was the owner of um, Roulette Records, which was highly influential in the recording of jazz musicians. And also another important factor is jukeboxes. This really starts in the 1930s. Jukeboxes becomes a phenomenal development in the technology of disseminating the music. Mm. And the mob controls this from very early on. Um, they own and control the companies that distribute the jukeboxes. And if you were a club owner or a restaurant owner, you were extorted and forced mm -hmm. to take certain two boxes. And if you tried to take others, some goons would show up at your place of business and throw the machine out in the street, or maybe something worse. There were deaths and killings related to the jukebox business. It was eventually investigated in another one of these congressional hearings called the McClellan hearings later in the 1950s, where Robert Kennedy Jr. was the lead counsel for that and he, um, launched an investigation into the jukebox business. So the mob had its hooks over the course of the decades following prohibition, the mob got its hooks into many different aspects of the business. In the book, I, I write about the cabaret card system and how that was actually an onerous system that in many ways was controlled by the mob and the corruption of the mob spreading the money to the police department the police department had a division that, that doled out cabaret cards and determined who worked and who didn't work. And so if you had a narcotics violation or certain other kinds of violation, you would be denied uh, the opportunity to make a living. And this would really force musicians into a corner and states of desperation. I mean, Charlie Parker in particular had his cabaret card taken from him on a, a couple of occasions and he couldn't get the card back for a period of two years and it drove him crazy. It probably drove him to become a junkie uh, out of frustration. So there were onerous and dark and, and uh, extortive aspects to this relationship that make it in some ways quite troubling. You know, um, not all people are good and not all people are bad. And so when we look at the, si the system of this relationship, what we find is there were some things about it that were great for the music and there's some and the musicians and some things about it that were not great for the musicians. I mean, it was basically a plantation system. Like like and, so much like so much of our society is, you know. I guess we're, we're talking about capitalism, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. the nature of capitalism. Uh, and in, in terms of jazz, it was it was so apparent that it was a plantation system that back during the glory years of the music in the 1920s, the clubs were called the Plantation Club right. or the right. Cotton Club. They were modeled on the plantation system. The whole aesthetic of these clubs had to do with uh, the aesthetic of the antebellum South based around servitude. These were clubs where Blacks were not allowed in as patrons. They worked the clubs as uh, waiters and bartenders 
and the talent, the musicians, but blacks were not allowed in the clubs. So it was a segregated Jim Crow concept that existed for a long time. And the musicians were made to submit to this. Many of them did so willingly because they're, as I said before, there was no other game in town. This was it, you know, you performed in mob controlled clubs or you didn't perform at all. So when, so when we're looking at the history of, of jazz, in addition to the, uh, the creative challenges and the challenges of just making a living, we need to also keep in the back of our minds that pretty much every jazz musician, uh, maybe until the recent era, has absolutely had to make some kind of peace with organized crime. They, they intersected with it. They, they were employed by them. They were controlled by them to a degree. This is just yeah, the reality you, of the history. Yeah. Now you could do that. You could, you could make, you could keep it at arm's length. It was entirely possible for a jazz musician to show up at a club and perform and not interact with the hoodlums, not have any major interaction with them. Particularly if you were not a star musician, if you were just a member of the band, you know, you, you'll hear some musicians say I performed during these eras and I never saw a gangster or anyone I knew was a gangster in the clubs. I'm not sure how you would know that, by the way. It wasn't like they wore uniforms. I mean, um, gangsters had a look that was, became so popular that everyone who came to the clubs looked like a gangster at a certain point. You know, they wore the fedora and the long coats and they, there was a certain look that became the look um, that average citizens adopted. Um, but if you were a big star like Earl Father Hines, or Duke Ellington, or um, Louis Armstrong, then you were brought into the forefront of this relationship because you were dealing with the gangsters, you were negotiating deals to perform in their clubs, you were maybe negotiating uh, recording deals with people like Mo Levy. You found yourself on the front lines of this relationship. Most of the musicians, as they explained it in later years, and they didn't talk about it much at the time it was happening, this was kind of a forbidden subject. You didn't sit down and read an interview with Duke Ellington in 1940, where he talked about the mobsters in the club, never. Um, it was verboten. It was kind of a, 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 almost like a secret history in a way. But after these musicians got older in their 70s and all the gangsters were dead and gone, they started to tell tales about this era. And um, Father Hines in particular, the great piano player, performed at clubs in Chicago that were mobbed up clubs. And he wrote a memoir that's loaded with all kinds of anecdotes of his interactions with the mob figures in the many, many years that he was there. He, he was at one club, um, Lincoln Gardens, I think it was, for a 12 year stint during the, the years of prohibition and beyond. And so he got to know a lot of these gangsters and he was made to interact with them in, in, in ways. And he said, there's not a popular musician in jazz, including uh, Ellington and Louis Armstrong and me, who were not a part, and who, uh, the way he put it was, who were not owned by the mob. Wow. Owned. So, owned. so, so um, you know, in addition to being uh, great artists and great composers and great band leaders, they had to be great diplomats, too. They had to navigate this, uh, this scary world, frankly. They had to have street smarts, you know, which is um, an element of the music, I think. It, it's, it's, um, it's very knowing music. Jazz music understands uh, the nature of uh, dark corners and shadows. It also understands the nature of love and, and lust and romantic interactions. Jazz is supposed to be worldly in its understanding of the world. And I think it's particularly true of jazz because of the fact that it came out of this relation, business relationship with the underworld. I'll give you an example of it. Um, anyone can take the great era of Duke, Elling Duke Ellington Orchestra in the late 1920s at a time when the Duke Ellington Orchestra was the house band at the Cotton Club. And you listen to songs like um, Creole Love Call and Black and Tan Fantasy and The Mooch. Um, these are, this is music composed by Ellington that I believe is of the underworld, by the underworld, and for the underworld. Duke Ellington understood 
that he was performing at a club that was owned by gangsters, that it was primarily gangsters coming into the clubs, and it was the and the patrons were white people who, to a degree, were slumming in black culture. They were in love with jazz and they loved the titillation. They loved the fact. I think some of them, given that the decor of the place was servitude and slavery and the in the antebellum South, they liked the idea of it. They were drawn to the idea of it, and so. Ellington had an awareness of this, and he was writing music. And when you listen to it, I implore anyone who's hearing this to go listen to the song, The Mooch. And what you will hear is the soundtrack of this relationship. Ellington was very conscious of the fact that he was writing music that was infused with these attitudes of the underworld. It's underworld music. It's mysterious. It's a little bit naughty. Mm. It captures the flavor of everything we're talking about here. This is great. You know, and TJ, we could talk on this subject for for days. Right. Um, and but I think this is a good jumping off point for me to remind people all this and a lot more is in a book called Dangerous Rhythms, just out by TJ English. Uh, it's going to broaden and deepen and make your appreciation of jazz even more profound. So as much as you love the music today, uh, start listening to uh, Duke Ellington's music. We might even put a clip uh, of the mooch below. Uh, oh, by, and, by the yeah. way, I should, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I should mention I did put together a playlist and it's available on Spotify and iTunes under the heading of Dangerous Rhythms. Check it out. 50, 50 songs from the earliest uh days of new orleans right up until oh the late 1980s uh and a lot of different styles are represented there um and you can put it on and listen to it all day long in fact you can listen to it while you're reading the book perfect perfect yeah. so so um and so they can get that on spotify and where else itunes itunes so yeah. uh and what's do you, do you know off hand what the name of the the, the uh, playlist is yeah it's just dangerous rhythms jazz in the underworld Okay, so guys, guys, here's what I recommend: uh, go to Spotify or iTunes, get get that playlist, start listening to it. Go to your local bookstore, or if you must, go to Amazon, hit order, uh, and get deep into the history of jazz. TJ English, thank you so much for this. This has uh, been a pleasure to to talk with you. My pleasure. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos.